Hi, I'm Tracy, VE3TWM. Thank you for tuning in to Outdoors on the Air. There is one aspect of HF portable operations I do not see addressed very often, but there is a link between RF power output, batteries and antennas that is absolutely critical to building a successful station. The key to having success in the field is having a station that performs well enough to make contacts across a variety of propagation conditions. How you set up your station to meet this need is dependent on how you intend to operate. For example, what mode will you be using? If you are going to be operating CW or digital, your output power and choice of antenna become less critical as those modes can do very well even with low power and compromise antennas. Alternatively, if you want to run SSB, you need to either bump up your RF output or use a better antenna system. There are three major components to your field radio system. You'll need a rig, a battery, and an antenna. When building a station for parks on the air or any other portable operation, for example field day, the single most important element of your station will always be the battery. Without a good battery that will last for the duration of your event, you're not going to have a positive experience. Next in importance is the antenna. Yes, I've listed the rig last on the list of the three basic components of a good portable station, and it's a distant third. That's because there are an awful lot of rigs out there, old and new, that will do just fine when used in a portable setting, provided they are teamed up with an appropriate power supply and a decent antenna. So now that we know the order of importance, how does one make good decisions when putting together a portable station? Interestingly, logical choices for all three components are variable depending upon the application and the desired outcome. Let's consider a typical parks on the air activation. Most POTA ops are no more than two or three hours in duration. This means you'll need a big enough battery to power whichever rig you choose to run at a given power level for two to three hours. To determine just how much battery capacity you'll need, consider the current drain of the rig you want to use. First, let's consider a prospective transceiver's current draw on receive. The lower the current draw on receive, the longer your battery life will be, since you'll be in receive mode far more than you will be in transmit mode. Now let's reflect on the amount of current drawn on transmit you'll need to take the amount of power you intend to run into consideration when sizing your battery. This is because the power level you choose to operate at is going to play a major role in your ability to stay on the air for the time span you want to operate. Did you know that any given rig will draw more current when transmitting at 100 watts than when transmitting at 20 watts? With some rigs, the difference is considerable. Let's take as an example the Yaesu FT891. The 891 is widely used by POTA activators. This is a 100 watt transceiver that draws about 1 amp on receive. Using the FT891 as the example, it draws about 14 amps on transmit at 100 watts. If we turn the RF output down to 80 watts, that number drops to 12 amps. And if we go down to 20 watts, the current draw is only 7.5 amps, or just over half of what it draws at 100 watts. By the way, I did not choose those specific power levels at random, but I'll get more into that in a moment. So the current drain of your intended rig is the first variable we must take into consideration. You may be wondering why I've mentioned operating at 20 watts rather than 30, 40, or 50. There's an old radio truism which states to add one S unit to your signal at the receiving end, you need to quadruple your power. If you stop and think about that, you'll understand that one S unit is not a lot. 
only rarely does one S unit make the difference between being heard or not being heard. To illustrate my point, take a 5 watt QRP transceiver. If I am running 5 watts and the station on the other end is receiving me at 7 S units, I would need to bump up my power to 20 watts to get to 8 S units on the far end. To register a 9 S unit signal at the receiving station, I'll need to increase my RF output to 80 watts. In my estimation, the additional 1 S unit increase is not worth the high price of increased battery drainage. Therefore, if I am not running QRP, I only run 20 watts when operating portable. In most cases, running at 20 watts with a full-length half-wave antenna up high and in the clear will remove the need to run 100 watts. If you're paying close attention, you'll realize even if you want to run full power, you might as well run at 80 watts rather than 100, since no one at the receiving end will ever be able to tell the difference between you running 80 or 100 watts. Your battery and finals will thank you for keeping the output below 100 watts. In 2017, I conducted a test during field day where I spent an hour hunting and pouncing stations at 5 watts, then another hour doing the same at 20 watts. I found that at 20 watts, I was able to work twice as many stations than I did running 5 watts. And that makes sense given the high QRM found during field day, where many stations clog the bands. A 1S unit difference at the receiving end gained by quadrupling the power to 20 watts was enough to push me above the QRM, enabling me to make the additional contacts. In other circumstances where there is no major contest running, a 1S unit difference in signal will not result in such a large difference in contacts made. To back this up, in the fall of 2020, I made 32 single sideband contacts with a QRP transceiver at Arrowhead Provincial Park during a POTA activation in about an hour and a half. If I had been running 20 watts, I might have made a few more contacts, but nowhere near twice as many. I was able to work almost every station I heard coming back to my call while running at 5 watts out. Since there was no wall-to-wall -wall QRM from contest stations to compete with, my QRP signal, coupled with a good full-sized 40-meter antenna, up at about 25 feet, put out a signal strong enough to make contacts all over eastern North America. Now let's do some battery sizing. If I want to run my Yesu FT891 for a POTA event lasting two hours, I can use a 10 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery if I run at 20 watts. If I want to run the 891 for a long event like field day though, that 10 amp hour battery is not going to last more than a few hours, even at 20 watts. A 30 amp hour battery is a better fit, but even so it may not last the entire contest, depending upon how many of the 24 hours I run. Contrast that with a QRP rig like my Yesu FT817. This tiny rig puts out 5 watts and draws a lot less power. The 817 only pulls 320 milliamps on receive and only about 1.4 amps on transmit at 5 watts. The rule of thumb I used with the 817 is to take the battery's rated amp hours, subtract one, and the result is the number of hours I can use the rig. For example, if I use my 10 amp hour Life PO4 battery with the 817, I can safely expect to get about 9 hours of use before depleting the battery. So if I want to use my 817 for a POTA activation, a 10 amp hour battery is more than sufficient, though I could do just fine with a tiny 3 or 4 amp hour battery. Finally, let's look at your antenna selection. It won't take you much searching to find videos of people on YouTube using low to the ground convenient but compromised antennas during POTA activations. You'll also notice most of these people will be running high power, that being 100 watts output. 
the bottom line is they need to pump out that much power to make up for what is in effect a subpar antenna. In my own case, I choose not to use that type of antenna, but rather full-sized half-wave antennas put up as high as I can get them. Dipoles, off-center fed dipoles and end feds that do not require a counterpoise wire to be laid on the ground are all good choices for this application. By using a full-sized antenna up high, I can run 20 watts and make as many or even more contacts as those running full power on their low short antennas. Not only will I be able to get out well, but I'll also be able to operate my station quite a bit longer at a given battery capacity because my lower RF power level drains the battery at a slower rate. Well, we've covered batteries, antennas, and rigs. If you take my advice into consideration, you should be able to handle a Parks on the Air activation with every expectation of success. Once you've got a POTA activation or two under your belt, why not consider taking the next step? There's a lot more to portable HF than POTA. Why not consider taking to the field for field day or even a major contest? These events are a lot of fun and present their own challenges. As long as you've got a capable battery and a good antenna, you'll make contacts and you'll gain experience both in portable station building and radio operating skills. That's all for this time. Thank you for watching. Now it's your turn. Get out of the shack, get outdoors, and get on the air. 7-3 from Tracy, VE3, TWM.